Hi, my name is Nathan Weisskopf. Welcome back to the Postcards of History YouTube channel. Today's video is going to be a uh, impression showcase that I had kind of alluded to um, and some comments that I had responded to as well as the outro of the previous impression showcase. Um, it's going to be a little bit more uh, casual, little, definitely a little shorter uh, for two reasons. One, because this is kind of still a work in progress impression. Uh, I'm still waiting on a few items that I had expected to get by now, but uh, it didn't pan out that way. So I wanted to at least get a video out showing it off. For the most part, this is finished. There are just a few things that I'm going to point out that aren't perfect. Um, the second reason it's going to be a little bit shorter is because, as you can probably see and hear, uh, I wanted to try a new backdrop, a new... A new uh, place to film a video I wanted to try outside. I have a, I have a really nice um, backyard. I got this little, you can probably see behind me, creek. Um, and I thought maybe for an impression showcase it might make it a little bit more natural. Obviously the downside is uh, a noise I can't control for. My mic probably isn't going to sound as good. And uh, as you can probably see from my face and my hair, it is summer. It is probably something like 90% humidity and I am dying out here. So. Uh, a lot of trade-offs to get the backdrop. Um, let me know what you think of it in the comments, because I'm going to do an updated version of this impression, like a new video, once I get some more pieces, and once I have more stuff to show off. And whatever the response is in this video will determine how I make that video when it does eventually come out. But with that being said, I want to go ahead and just walk you through, really, this very, very limited impression, um, and just talk about the history of it a little bit. So with that being said, I'm going to put my cap back on and let's get started. So the first piece of any impression, obviously, is the uniform I'm wearing. Uh, the uniform I'm wearing is roughly representative of a Bulgarian infantryman in the summer period of like 1915-1916. I want to make it clear that bo the Bulgarian side of my impressions is definitely, I have a lot less research on this side, I'm not as familiar with it, there's a lot less reading in general on it. So, whereas a lot of stuff in the, the Kaiserschützen impression video I did, I talked about with certainty, or with a lot more accuracy, you're going to hear a lot more kind of vagary and, and, and rough timelines, it's not going to be perfect. And unfortunately it's as good as you're going to get on YouTube with Bulgarian infantry impressions, because as far as I know I'm the first person in the US who's completed one. So, with that being said, my tunic isn't really a tunic. It, you probably recognize it if you're familiar with Russian um, World War I impressions or uniforms. It appears very much like their undershirt, um, which sometimes was worn as a tunic. It was the same thing in the Bulgarian army. This was a, a shirt, but during the summertime they would ditch their tunics and just wear this shirt. Uh, it does have a name in Russian and also Bulgarian. I'm not going to butcher it because I don't even remember it off the top of my head. Um, but just to, just to be clear, this isn't like a tunic. They had a full wool tunic. It was the same brown tobacco wool as these trousers. Uh, but that would mainly be reserved for winter time, colder months, and, you know, for the soldiers who didn't have access to this shirt. The cap matching the shirt is of a white linen. It's a similar style to the Bulgarian, the, re the regular wool cap. It's just made in white linen. The other difference being, you don't wear the cockade on the white linen caps. And then the trousers are the part I'm going to talk about in, in more the history aspect because I actually don't have a proper reproduction right now. What you can see, they are the brown tobacco, but these are actually post-war uh, communist era Bulgarian trousers. The, the wool shade stayed roughly the same from the from World War One up until the Soviet period, but uh, the biggest difference between the World War One trousers and these is the World War One trousers had red piping going along the side. Obviously, as you can see, I don't have the red piping on these. Um, so yeah, the, the main uniform was a full brown wool uniform. Later in the war, it kind of switched more to like a greenish shade of wool. Something to point out with the Bulgarian army is even with the stuff they domestically produced like uniforms, supply was always limited throughout the war and especially with things like arms and, and heavier industry um, items, 
they were solely reliant on their allies. And I'm going to talk about that more briefly when I cover the rifle and some more of the history. But that's a brief overview of the, the uniform. Really quickly before I move on, I'm going to grab one of my reproduction wool caps and just show that off real quick so you can see the cockade in that more greenish wool color. So let me grab that real quick. There's definitely a lot of noise going on right now, so I apologize for that. A plane just flew over. You can hear dogs and machinery in the background. But this is more representative. Well, it is one of the wool caps, but this shade is definitely more representative of the later kind of green wool color. Uh, you can see also on the front, we have the Bulgarian cockade. I got very lucky to get this reproduction from someone who already had one. I don't know of really many, so I don't know of anywhere. I haven't been able to find a source for them yet. But you can see it's painted in the Bulgarian national colors. It's got the, the red and the green. And the cap itself has the red piping. So something I forgot to mention of the uniform, uh, and I'm going to use to talk about the imports Bulgaria received from their allies, is my boots. Uh, obviously a pretty important part of the uniform. These are actually 1866 German jack boots. The vast majority of the ones in service in the Bulgarian army would be dyed black. You don't really tend to see any other colors like brown or the, the natural leather colors. Uh, but this speaks to a problem Bulgaria had where they couldn't really rely on domestic production for most things. So obviously leading them in to the rifle, the Monlicker 1895 was the rifle most widely used in their service. Obviously not made by the Bulgarians. They also didn't have any domestic copies. Any of the ones they received were exclusively uh, imported from Austria-Hungary. Uh, and this becomes even more of a problem when they can't even manufacture the ammo for them. So any ammo they needed to receive was also imported from their allies. So obviously later in the war when both Germany and Austria-Hungary were facing shortages, they could spare even less wartime material to Bulgaria. Uh, and this is why in their army you see captured weapons from the allies, you see lots of Mosins in service, you even would see uh, some older uh, powder weapons from the from the time of the Bulgarian Revolution in the late or mid to late 1800s, still in service with things like rearline troops or uh, formations that weren't necessarily relegated to combat duties. So it's finally nice and quiet. Uh, I want to talk you through. I'm going to spend the last part of this video talking you through the equipment I'm wearing, and if I can do it in one take, I'll just do the outro. So the equipment I'm wearing. Let's start with the belt. The belt is just a very 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 basic single prong, leather belt, um, roller buckle, completely, completely standard. Uh, they would wear the buckle to their side, the right side, um, and the reproduction itself is actually a reproduction of a World War II Soviet belt. The, the style was almost identical, and the Bulgarians would actually retain this style of belt all the way through World War II, even into the Cold War period. The pouches, you might look at them, and if you're familiar with Austro-Hungarian equipment, you might say, hey, those are Model 1888 pouches. You'd be wrong, because the big difference is, is the Austro-Hungarians did not mirror their pouches. So on an Austro-Hungarian pouch, they'd be slanted to the one side, especially the, it's much more prevalent with the 1888s than it is the uh, 1895s, because they have that slanted side. So on an Austro-Hungarian pouch, it's slanted to the same side no matter which side of the belt it's on. On these, you can see the flat section is in the middle and the slanted sides both face outward. These are, I think the official designation is 1888 slash 15, because it's model 1888 slash 1915. And these were domestically produced by the Bulgarians, but they were also supplemented, supplementally produced, I don't know the word, supplementarily produced by the Germans. So a lot of original ones you can find actually have stamps on the back that say Berlin. Um, actually, I, I own an original pair that say Berlin on the back. Now, the remainder of the equipment, very simple. I just have an Austrian style frog with an 1895 bayonet, obviously matches the rifle. Um, they would, they had different, they would use German frogs. They, they like because they received imports from all their allies, they received whatever whatever they could get. So you see a lot of mixture of both Austrian and German equipment, even on the same soldier. And then on my side, or I guess back almost, I have a German gas mask bag uh, holding a Model 1915 gas mask. Now this would actually be an irregularity, believe it or not. You'd think they would be issued bags uh, that'd be easy, that'd be easier to produce, obviously, than uh, cans. But you'd actually be wrong. The, the vast majority 
of soldiers that were equipped with gas masks would receive the German style gas mask cans. This maybe only accounted for something like 10% of the army, if that, and they, they, towards the end of the war they became almost non-existent. It was more so a phenomenon in the start of the war for Bulgaria. Um, but that is really all the equipment I have to show you. I guess to talk about the rifle real quick, I've shown it off in my other videos. It is just a Monlicker 1895 long rifle. Uh, same one I was using in my Kaiserschützen video. It's not like it's uh, any different. Now some of the Bulgarian ones would be stamped with the Bulgarian uh, royal crest, the lion, but some weren't. Some were just, you know, hand-me-downs from the Austro-Hungarian military that were shipped over. Um, but that's really it. As I, as I said, they, this wasn't the only rifle, it was just the majority. They also used Mausers, they used, uh, or not Mausers, um, at the time it would have been Gewehrs. They used Gewehrs um, from Germany. They used Mosins uh, from Russia, a lot of them left over from when Bulgaria and Russia were still on more friendly terms. And then they used a lot of old black powder designs that, from the, the late 1850s. I kind of talked about that earlier. But uh, th once again, a big thing about Bulgaria is they had a massive army. They conscripted almost a million men, maybe more. And you have to think about this. They conscripted that many men in a country of, at the start of the war, four and a half million people. So, almost 25% of their population, they were not exactly a heavily industrialized economy. They were industrialized to the Balkans, and they had undergone some very rapid industrialization from the period of their independence to World War I, but it was still not enough to maintain an army the, the size that they did. So... When it came to equipment, they used what they, could, what, what they could get from their allies, captured stuff, stock left over from previous wars or previous uh, iterations of their army equipment. And it, really, anything goes. And that's not to give you an excuse for anyone who does this impression, including me, to just mix and match things. You should still use stuff that there is evidence for. But it is to say to a lot of people it appears strange because there is a lot of mix and matching going on. Um... With that being said, uh, expect some Bulgarian-themed postcard reviews, as well as uh, possibly a history video or two pertaining to uh, their history not only during World War I, but leading up to it. Kind of the, the prelude, uh, their War of Independence, the, the industrialization and urbanization of the late 1800s, the Balkan Wars, all of it served as a setup to why Bulgaria ch chose the side they ultimately did. Um, you know, whereas most of the other Balkan powers sided with the Entente, Bulgaria sided with the Central Powers, even though they were siding with uh, Turkey, who was their, kind of their sworn enemy just a few years earlier. So with that all being said, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, the next impression showcase is going to be a Kaiserschützen officer impression. I have a lot of the pieces uh, acquired already. I'm still working on getting more, and you, you, that's probably not going to be out until I would say October at the earliest, maybe November. There, there's a lot to work on, and I'm still even getting started on some of the tailoring uh, for that. So, um, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this neat, neat look into the uniform of a Bulgarian infantryman during the World War One era. Uh, in the future, as I said, I will be doing an updated version of this impression, um, not only with the better trousers, but I'll also eventually be doing uh, a version with the full uniform, uh, full wool uniform, hopefully a uh, much more extensive marching kit, like like the Tornister, the Haversacks, stuff like that. Uh, but I'm talking about this in the context of the future. It's not soon. I'm sorry it took me so long to get a new video out, and I'm going to try to, to be a little bit more consistent in my content. What I don't want to ever do is just release bad content as filler. I always want to make sure the videos I'm releasing are watchable, are interesting, and uh, have, have work put into me, uh, work put into by me. So with that all being said, uh, thank you for, for giving me your time in this video. I hope you've been able to learn something. And... Um, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much and you have a great day.